Thanks for joining us. I'm Melissa. I'm the executive director and along with Jeff Smith, the co-founder of Advocates for Snake Preservation. For those unfamiliar with ASP, we're a 501c3 charity devoted to changing how people view and treat snakes. And we do this through um, a few ways, mainly storytelling about wild snake behavior to counter prevailing myths, and also to make snakes more familiar by showing people a little different side of them. And we also provide solutions to human snake conflicts that sometimes end badly for people and often prove fatal for snakes. And I imagine that that area is something that many of you are interested in, and that's probably why you came for our guest tonight, which is Brian Hughes. Um, and Brian founded Rattlesnake Solutions in 2010 as a way to further conservation and education in the community. And by the community, I mean the, the Phoenix Valley, at least initially. Um, although I think you've expanded your reach at this point, because that was a long time ago. Um, and in 2013, um, he pioneered, along with some experts in construction, the first actual deterrent to snakes getting in people's yards, which is fencing. And anyone of you who has talked to us about how to keep snakes from getting in your yard, you know, that's always like my number one, like if you really don't want them there, a fence is the way to go. And I think that a lot of the um, specifications and guidelines that we've shared about um, snake exclusion fencing have probably come from Brian's work. So we have that to think. And yeah, 2010, that was a long time ago. So since then, Brian and Rattlesnake Solutions has resolved thousands of human snake conflicts in Arizona. So, so excited to have him here because this is a hot topic um, about snakes that live in our backyards and in the surrounding area. All right, there we go. Everyone see that? Yep. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, as you can imagine, and as you said, uh, it's it's a big topic right now. All the snakes are moving. Uh, our phones have been going nuts. Emails, like, it, I, I turn my phone off, not because it's going to ring, just because I don't want to know what's happening right now. It's been that kind of... Um, that's what's happening right now. The number of snakes that people are seeing is is enormous, and everybody has questions. It's obviously a big topic, so I'm glad everybody's here to start learning about it. So, um, yeah, my name is Ryan Hughes, uh, Rattlesnake Solutions. That's our business, and we do we do a lot. So um, we we provide relocation and uh, prevention of snakes, of course, but that goes to other things too. So we're a private company, but we fund a lot of things um, that are are not um uh business related and our accountant probably thinks we're idiots but it's just an easy way to to do these things we can just kind of go out and and purchase things like pit tags if it's something that interests us um we also provide a lot of education training safety services um we provide training to arizona game of fish state of arizona military units um, about how to handle rattlesnakes and how to operate safely in those areas. We also conduct our own research on this topic, rattlesnakes in urban areas. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit. And this, I love snakes. I love rattlesnakes. So there's this constant field time, you know, when there's not something work to do with snakes, then, okay, well, I'm going to go, going to go uh, have some, some uh, fun time. I'll, I'll go look for some snakes. Why not? So it's just kind of a constant thing. And of course, we have all these animals behind us that are education animals that um, work with us as well. Um, the information that I'm going to be talking about today is going to come from numerous sources. Okay, so uh, most of it is going to be coming from the records of uh, snakes relocations that have happened between the Phoenix and Tucson areas. And there are um, many thousands of those. Um, and publications that have been derived from those records. Uh, we also have a snake identification service where people can email us or just text us, hey, what's this thing I saw on my hike? We'll tell them what it is. Sometimes we learn something too. It helps with distribution um, and service or surveys and research that we are also conducting ourselves. Um, in addition to our work with the Arizona Game and Fish Department and the city of Phoenix, we also provide uh, survey um, services to other organizations and nonprofits that have land and just want to know what lives there. And then just kind of my own stuff that I see. I spent a lot of time looking for snakes and there's some, um, you know, I get to have some experience. So, so I'm going to be moving between a lot of these things. So the place that we work 
Um, it's not just, you know, Arizona, obviously, but the Phoenix and Tucson metro areas, which are kind of starting to merge. I think this is going to look very different in, in 50 years. And there's a, um, a big um, collision course here of a lot of different things that is at the heart of this topic of snakes and people or the other way around. And this presentation is different than others that I typically give or some that you may have uh, seen from, from me or my, my group, because this is less about, you know, here are the snakes, here's something about them. And this is a lot more about just what, the, what this conflict is, um, how and where this happens and what those snakes are and, and how differently. There's a lot of very interesting things uh, and challenges there that come up. Um, some big ones. And this is a picture that I, I took from our, our study site in Phoenix Mountain Preserve that just sums it up. These are all homes that butt right up against a mountain. Um, on this particular mountain, that little drainage that goes behind those homes, um, there's three different species of rattlesnakes. They are very common there. Um, people see those snakes pretty often, but a lot of people in those homes have, you know, they all have different feelings about that. So um, it's not only a conflict of the urbanization of such a huge region like Phoenix and Tucson, uh, it's the diversity of habitat and species of snakes that are here, and also of cultures. If you were to visit Arizona 40 years ago, um, a lot of places that seem like they're pretty urban would look very different. So we have um, now Phoenix, this big monster that's growing outward very quickly and just gobbling up these smaller communities. So snakes become something that is important in that discussion. So we'll talk about all these things. This is usually how this looks. Um, this is kind of the rubber hits the road situation here. This is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. It is sitting right outside somebody's front door. Um, I think regardless of how you feel about snakes, if you like them or don't like them or what the situation is here, um, this is something that you can see is going to have some, some obvious conflict, not only because there's a, a venomous snake there right next to where somebody might put a foot, um, but also just all the different outcomes that could come from this, depending on who sees it first or who comes out that door. Um, this is not a rare event. Phoenix is a huge place. Um, just our organization moves around one and a half thousand snakes per year. Um, that does not reflect the actual size of this. There are fire departments that move them. There are lots of uh, just individuals that move them from their own homes. Um, there are pest control companies, security companies, uh, the Phoenix Herpetological Society, Arizona Herpetological Association. You get it. There's a lot of people moving snakes around and a lot of sightings of snakes. So this is a this is a big thing. If you're if you live in the Phoenix or Tucson areas, um, snakes and uh, they're they're part of your life, whether it just be on your social media feed or or uh, in, in you know in your your pool. Um, and it's not just for people or or residential areas. This is a Western Diamondback that we caught at, at Top Golf last year. Um, there were lots of people there uh, and just vacationers to Phoenix. So if you're, uh, you know, there's lots of resorts here. It's also a growing area for large warehouses. I mean, we've been to the, uh, the Amazon warehouse numerous times to go get rattlesnakes out of there. Uh, lots of agriculture, obviously. Um, there's just a lot of different situations that having a presence in Arizona are going to maybe put you in conflict with a rattlesnake. So these snakes themselves, and if, you know, I love snakes, if you don't love snakes, then Arizona may or may not have uh, as much appeal to you in some ways. But Arizona in general has a, a tremendous amount of diversity uh, of, of habitat um, and, um, and snakes. So give me a second here, I'm going to see if I can show my notes to myself. That's what I'll do with that. Um, so between, you know, if you were to go from the, the Mexican border and hike up to the, the Utah border, you're going to be going through so many different types of habitat um, and then all so geographic barriers. So we have the Grand Canyon there. We have the convergence of four different deserts. So we have um, subalpine tundra and high elevation grasslands and all kinds of stuff here. Uh, these give a tremendous amount of opportunity for animals to isolate and speciate and create diversity. So a lot of that happens right here in these these areas where um, you know a lot of people when they move here are surprised to learn that wait a minute, there's not just you know rattlesnakes, there's all these different kinds of rattlesnakes and they look very different from one another and they do different things and you can find them in different places, that kind of thing. So it's a very uh, surprising thing when people move here. 
Um, diversity of rattlesnakes is, is huge here. So to put it in, in context, we have 13 species uh, here in the state of Arizona. Uh, there are six species in just Phoenix metro area alone. There's also six in Tucson. They're slightly different. So um, the more rattlesnakes are in this state than any other state, and there are more rattlesnakes in um, both of these metro areas than any other city. There are more rattlesnakes um, found within 10 miles of uh, downtown Phoenix than there are in most states that you consider to be pretty snaky. Um, and it's also one of the fastest growing areas of the country, depending on the year, Phoenix or Tucson um, is the fastest. So tremendous amount of development, uh, tons of snakes, lots of diversity. It is a very dynamic and complex issue. And one of the things that is interesting um, that I wasn't aware of when I first drove past Camelback Mountain, when I moved here 24 years ago and thought there couldn't be any snakes there. It's been in town. It's been in the city too long. There wouldn't be any rattlesnakes there. Um, there are no areas in Phoenix, in the Phoenix metro area. That's mostly what I'm going to be talking about because I, I know a little bit better, um, where you can't find a native snake. There are none. So just in this photograph uh, in the background here, the golf course in the foreground that's has its own ecology. Um, there are uh, gopher snakes and king snakes and long-nosed and ground snakes that are abundant there, very abundant there. Um, the, the palm trees behind there, there's little slippers of, of lawn where night snakes and uh, ground snakes are common. And even downtown in Phoenix, any little sliver of you know empty lot or grass is going to have ground snakes there. Um, we find gopher snakes hanging out near dumpsters by um, you know parking garages, and they're missing an eye and their tail is gone. And you can see this snake has never seen a saguaro. Um, these are native snakes that have figured it out and the, the city, you know, they're instead of being out in the desert doing their thing, they're hunting roof rats and in the, the citrus jungle of Paradise Valley. Um, and in the mountain in the background, that the South Mountain, and on that mountain, you can find um, five different species of rattlesnakes. There used to be six a few years ago, and we haven't seen any evidence of sidewinders at the base anymore, but that's a, you know, that's a different topic. But be, in this picture is just, this, it's such a diverse and uh, different uh, situation that what I think a lot of people expect is that there are snakes around the outside of the city. And if you live in the middle, you'll never see a snake. Um, it's not accurate, especially if you hike. Uh, the rattlesnakes in particular, though, um, they are more specialized. They um, do not do as well in the city. And by in the city, I mean, you know, if you live in a neighborhood, um, every street that you cross, every minor street that you cross, every home that you are pulled back from uh, access, direct access to native desert um, is going to make you drastically reduce your chances of seeing snakes. The number of snakes that somebody sees right at their house is very different than somebody that lives, you know, 100 yards in from there. Uh, and there's also lots of harmless snakes that we are, are called to relocate, and this is how we find them. Uh, if you were wondering, too, if it was something that crossed your mind, why we would relocate harmless snakes, uh, this is one of the reasons is that um, it's not always a survivable situation. It's not always something where you say, you know, hey, leave it alone. It's it's fine. These are snakes that are, there's a coach whip, uh, caught in a glue trap, a, uh, a gopher snake caught in bird netting, and a ground snake found inside of a, a building. <laughs> so um, these are not things that other people are going to be uh, able to, 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 to resolve. Uh, and also, you can tell from talking to people, you know, I think, and this is different than what I first thought um, when I, what I first thought when I was doing this is if somebody calls and there's a gopher snake in their yard and they're terrified of it, you, if you say good news, it's just a gopher snake and then, you know, get out of the situation, but the, they'll still kill, you know, a lot of times that snake is not going to end up good. So we, we learn how to read the room and we learn how to try to provide um, what we can to, to both those situations. But uh, the point of this is that these harmless snakes, it's a, you know, very diverse group of animals that have varying degrees of of uh, specialization and generalization and, and, and able ability to figure out how to live in these urban areas. So um, they have a very different uh, look at um, how the city looks. So this is Phoenix. You can kind of tell where the outskirts of Phoenix are around the freeways. So um, there's the 101, the 303 up to the, the top left there, and then the 202 that encompasses the, the East Valley. Around the edges of that is where um, there's the most development, and there's also the most homes that are built um, with the type of uh, semi-native Zurich 
um, habitat or transition zone um, that is more common in the, the, the newer Phoenix areas. A lot of the stuff in the middle, Paradise Valley, uh, Glendale, Phoenix, Tempe, um, those are, are different. It's the, you know, citrus trees, palm trees, um, you know, green lawns, that kind of thing. So um, the rattlesnakes are so tied to that native habitat that um, save uh, for some random ones that show up in the middle of town for some reason, you know, transplants, they hitch to ride on something. This is where the rattlesnakes are, um, are concentrated. You'll see that there's uh, big concentrations around the mountains and right adjacent to those situations. Um, but there is also a little blip right in the middle of town that's pretty dense. And then there's everything north of the 101 highway. Uh, I live in that little part up on top called Cave Creek. So that area has so many rattlesnake encounters just because of the way that the, the homes are built. Um, there are usually on larger lots. Uh, they're usually newer areas. There's lots of development there. And um, there are lots of places where the, um, the native habitat has, has been uh, kept intact. Part of that is unfortunately just state land that hasn't been bought yet or developed yet. Uh, and a lot of it is intentional. There's lots of great uh, communities up here where they um, build homes and, and neighborhoods that are, you know, they're in line with what the, the Sonoran Desert is. They're using a lot of native plants and using things that specialists here can, um, can use. So um, this is just a graphic that we share with homeowners on, on occasion when they're asking where the snakes are, just to show like, hey, it can be dramatically different depending on just where you, um, where exactly you are to where houses on the corner of one of those big shared walls that a lot of these newer neighborhoods have, can have multiple times more rattlesnake encounters than just the, the house next door. And again, the one from over there. So just being interior, even if it's a, a neighborhood that gets a lot of rattlesnakes, just being you know literally across a street or a couple of houses in can be very uh, different. So rattlesnakes themselves, uh, very specialized, uh, relatively predictable where they're going to be found. Uh, and then the blue that's added in here, those are the non-venomous snakes laying over the top of that. And then you have a very different picture. Um, all that blue that's through the Paradise Valley, uh, the northeast part of the of the city, uh, those are densely populated areas. Those are, there's busy roads. Um, there's, you know, other than some, some parks, there's nothing there that would resemble native habitat, but you have uh, king snakes, gopher snakes, very common through there, ground snakes and night snakes, uh, long nose snakes, surprisingly, um, are, are all through there. And then that's most of the East Valley. Um, some surprising things for me too, is that in here is, um, a lot of the areas like South Chandler that backs up to a lot of agriculture, not a lot of snake encounters. I mean, there are snakes that are there, but it, for whatever reason, it doesn't um, turn into encounters. Uh, we don't see a lot of rattlesnakes that are there. A um, couple key, key areas for that are, are points of interest in here. So this little square right here, this is Peoria. Um, it's a very, very dense area. We're up there multiple times a day. Um, to get rattlesnakes out of those areas. There's tons of development. And by development, I mean, as soon as they finish one block of, of 800 homes, they're starting the next one. So there's there's just no equilibrium that's reached. There's no stability there. So there's tons of rattlesnakes there. And if you look at this, this is the in that red there is the same area uh, from a publication that um, we uh, took part in and co-authored from 2017 of data from the 2014 field year for us. And you'll see that there's a few little dots in there, but it's it's not there's not a whole lot going on there. Um, there were people there, it just wasn't the same. And suddenly Peoria is now one of those hot spots. Um, so development is one of the major drivers of, of conflict um, to where you know behavior of the snakes aside, a bulldozer has a way of disrupting things. And it takes a long time for that to settle out. Uh, and, and it can do that in a lot of different ways. So um, it's been interesting watching this. You know, I think Rattlesnake Solutions has been around, you know, uh, long enough now. I think this is our, our 14th year, um, long enough to, to have seen how the city changes that outlook. This is Cave Creek. This is where I live. Um, very, very dense <laughs> number of of uh, rattlesnake encounters like we, I just described. Uh, it's also something I'll discuss a little bit later because when I moved here three years ago, I got to look at the situation a little bit differently as a resident rather than a, a visitor. Uh, and there's also this, this little blip in the middle, that dense blip, that is the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. It's right in the middle of the city. That's Camelback Mountain and Paestua. It's the place where people hike by the thousands every nice Saturday. 
Um, and we are doing some interesting work there. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So here are some of the really surprising things that I learned. Um, you know, these are just kind of things that, that need to be measured. Um, don't know why necessarily some of them, but uh, they're, they're, they're pretty interesting to me about this situation of snakes in town. Uh, first, here's a ball python. It's a pet. It's a common pet that people, um, you know, you can buy it any, any pet store for 20 bucks. Uh, it's also an animal that is heavily abused. Um, it's kind of like what bearded dragons would have been 15 years ago of just a, an animal that is seen as an entry level reptile pet. Uh, so sold very cheaply to people that are not planning on keeping a snake for 30 or 40 years. Uh, certainly not one that actually needs a lot of specialized care like a, a ball python. So they end up being released a lot or they end up escaping a lot um, for whatever reason. Um, this entry on the left there is from the identification page on our website, and I hated putting it there. Uh, they're not invasive because they're not reproducing here. They basically crawl around until they're found or die. But when we're writing the identification page here, are we looking at this? And this is the decision that, that, we, that I made. Uh, am I look, are we looking at this from um, a natural history, history perspective of somebody that wants to learn about snakes, or is this are people that are using this, people that are trying to identify the snake that's in their bathroom right now or in their backyard right now. And when you look at actual encounters, the ball python is encountered in wild situations by people in the Phoenix area more often, much more often than a lot of our native snakes. More people see ball pythons than see uh, patch nose snake or thread snakes or coral snakes. So it's on here because that's an answer. <laughs> and this other one is a ball python that was, uh, you know, that's in my hand from just a little while ago. This is a night snake. The night snakes are a little harmless snakes. They're found in a lot of places. Um, this is the snake that um, almost every snake that's going to be inside a home ends up being a night snake. There are other exceptions, but um, for the most part, night snakes are the ones that come inside homes. That's across the valley. It's in, in Tucson too. Not sure exactly why. It could be just, you know, there's lots of things that eat the things that they eat. There's lots of things that live in the places that they do. But for whatever reason, night snakes tend to take it a step further and are the, the animal that you're most likely to find in your kitchen at two o'clock in the morning. This is a ground snake. Very different. Uh, there's no ground snakes in Tucson. That's very surprising to me. Uh, when I first saw that or would, uh, was told that, I thought, well, okay, well, I can't be accurate. I'll just pull up, you know, all these thousands of records of snakes and sightings from our, our database and, and deliver some ground snake records. Uh, there are none. <laughs> so if you see a ground snake in Tucson, please, uh, please let me know. It'd be, it'd be interesting. So I have no idea why they're not there. Uh, so here's what we are doing about it, or what what we've kind of taken uh, upon ourselves to do. And it's a huge task, too. It's not the kind of thing that we are going to be equipped or um, be able to, or be the right people to address all of these things. Um, here's some of my some of my team doing various snake things, um, whether they're installing uh, snake fencing or, or removing a what looks you know a wad of gopher snakes that was in somebody's closet uh, to a short distance to to the desert. There's a lot of different activities that we're we're up to here. So this is kind of a summary of those. Uh, we we collect and provide data for urban conservation research that can take a lot of forms. We provide that information to Arizona Game of Fish every year. Uh, we also have partnerships with a number of universities and researchers um, that can use those data in a number of ways to get an idea of this conflict situation. Uh, we are conducting our own research. We're in our in our fifth year now of uh, a mark recapture survey in the Phoenix Mountain Preserve, where we have currently um, tagged and tagged hundreds of snakes and found many more, uh, have thousands of field hours in there. Uh, we are trying to improve the state of the practice of sustainable co uh, coexistence. That includes relocation. That includes what happens after relocation. Uh, it includes the, the, the whole process of a homeowner that has a snake in their yard and how they feel about it and what they're going to do about it. Um, there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, and ongoing education and culture change. Culture change is a, a term I'm using more and more um, as, I've, as I've learned that it's not just telling people about snakes, it is how they feel about snakes and why. So this is a bit about the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. Um, the Phoenix Mountain Preserve, the reason why this is important uh, on this topic is that unlike Peoria or Cave Creek or a lot of those other areas, um, it's a stable area. There's a big mountain in the middle of the city 
It has hundreds and hundreds of rattlesnakes there. There are thousands and thousands of people that, that hike there all the time. And the entire thing is surrounded by homes that were built in the, you know, between the sixties and the nineties. And it's, nothing's changing. It's stable. There's no new, you know, big patches of ground and hundreds of homes going in there. This is a, a series of uh, natural areas that have very much settled into whatever that situation is going to be. Population is doing well. It's stable. Um, people around in the area, it's stable. The, the number of, of uh, relocation calls we're going to get or conflicts in there is predictable. Um, so it's an ideal situation for us to look at um, this, this whole picture of what these areas like Peoria might look like in 20 years and learn what we can um, do different there. So here is that from that same paper uh, from 2017, you can see a little blip in the middle of um, uh, there's, there's a lot of rattlesnakes. There's a lot of rattlesnake encounters, but it's not as much of a problem. Uh, here's where it is. It's right in the middle of, of Phoenix. So we get data from here in a number of different ways. Uh, one of these is just from hikers. So we have uh, things on, at the trailheads. Um, anyone that's a hiker and they see a snake, they can send us a picture of it. And hopefully some other information, if they feel comfortable giving us the location, that kind of thing, we can put that in there. We can also use that basically as this bias control to make sure that we're not just uh, missing big things and and uh, help to kind of calibrate our own efforts. Uh, relocation groups like ourselves and other organizations that um, submit data to Arizona Game of Fish will also give us information of snakes that they have found in conflict in the areas around this, this particular park. Um, and then of course our own mark recapture survey where we are pit tagging snakes in there. We are trying to get recaptures in certain areas uh, to learn the population of snakes, who all lives there, what they're doing, uh, and basically hope to create a, um, a, a stable um, control essentially to do things like learn more about relocation, learn more about um, effective uh, coexistence methods and prevention methods, that kind of thing. So stuff that we're learning, here's a speckled rattlesnake. I've seen lots of those there. Um, one of the major threats uh, in some of these areas to diversity um, are unfortunately economic situations of people. Uh, in fact, it's looking like you may be able to predict um, the diversity of species in a segment of, of natural uh, preserve based on socioeconomic factors of the surrounding areas. Uh, essentially, um, a lot of the snakes that are, are being pushed out of critical microhabitat that they use uh, particularly for estivation, just this really hot part of the year. They go hide during the summer. Well, you know, if you have three or four speckled rattlesnakes, but somebody else wants to use that cave, the rattlesnakes are no longer there after that. So you have places like North Mountain, um, which used to have Western Diamondbacks, but there are no more Western Diamondbacks. There used to be tortoises there. We have no evidence that there's tortoises there anymore. Um, and this is likely the region uh, reason. Uh, there's also other things that we're, we're seeing evidence for, unfortunately, uh, people like myself that love snakes um, and go to these places to go look for rattlesnakes to take photographs and just to, you know to learn about them and enjoy them um, can have a pretty detrimental detrimental effect in some of those um, some of those cases where basically just they're just being bothered so much that they they leave or in some cases die. Uh, these are not things that I you know I'm happy about learning, but that is some of the data suggesting that. Uh, here's one of the interesting ones to me is that here is this preserve area. The roads create natural barriers. I mean, you'd think that'd be the case, right? Like roads are going to be a geographic barrier, but not to the level that I expected. I mean, each of these little regions of the park, um, it has its own distinct population of animals that uh, may not resemble the one next to it. You know, they all have pretty similar habitat too. So uh, in some of these areas, um, there are whole groups of animals that are entirely missing. Um, and then once you start throwing in other data from relocations, you get this other interesting picture that's showing up. So like, as I, as I said, uh, North Mountain doesn't have Western Diamondbacks living there. Uh, they don't, but the, the homes around North Mountain uh, do. So there are places where Western Diamondbacks have a stable population that seems to exist entirely within the backyards of the Bajadas that um, development covered up is what it's looking like. So it, it's interesting how, how, you know, you'd think that all the snakes are gonna be in the park, but um, there's, there's a lot left to learn there. So um, see lots of cool stuff like this. I think things that are probably under, you know, they're, they're known, 
but through a lot of anecdote, there's not as much information as needed about the summertime social aspects of um, things like speckled rattlesnakes, how in the hot parts of the summer, they'll group up in relatively large groups and give birth together. Lots of things that you, you know, might be familiar with seeing with um, timber rattlesnakes or Arizona black rattlesnakes where the social behavior is pretty well documented. It exists in a lot of these other species. It just happens at different times and, and it's hard to view because to, to see this, you have to hike in there when it's 110 degrees. So um, it's, it's not necessarily, necessarily fun, but it's also a reason why there's holes in, in those data. Uh, here's an area where, um, you know, one of many where lots of rattlesnake species might live together, uh, where they might have that same situation where they're estivating and giving birth in shared locations and even do so across species. And as diversity decreases in some of these little islands that are created by roadways, you end up with some other little weird things. Um, we don't know what this is. Um, when I first caught it, it was very, it's very large. Um, I, I, I don't remember exactly how big. <laughs> so, um, and I have that written down, of course, but it, it's as big as a very large speckled rattlesnake. Uh, it has some good coloration like a speckled rattlesnake. It has a large head, um, a black, it has a lot of characteristics of a speckled rattlesnake. Um, it also has a lot of characteristics of a tiger rattlesnake. Uh, the head scale pattern is a tiger rattlesnake. There's a lot of interesting things here. And this is not the only one of these that we have found in this one little tiny area. Um, so, you know, what happens when you take a whole bunch of rattlesnakes and put them into a very small area and then cut them off and isolate them? Well, you know, this might be a hybrid and we're working on ways to see if we can figure out, you know, is that why there's no tiger rattlesnakes in this area? Do they just interbreed with the others? Uh, we don't know yet, but things like this are very interesting. So I'm hoping that once we finish our work in the park, we'll be able to come up with some interesting things there. So this is a different snakes or everything presentation for this next segment. And I would I would very much encourage everybody to go check this out because this is the groundwork for a lot of the other stuff I'm going to be talking about for this next segment. And that deals with uh, the relocation of, of rattlesnakes or essentially there's a rattlesnake in an area the it's not tolerable that it's there for one reason or another it needs to go somewhere so what do you do and that is a very complicated uh dynamic and controversial topic so i would definitely check this out from uh, erica nowak um who's done a tremendous amount of research on this and is basically the you know, that that research um is what we base uh all of our work on with some with some other additions um, on on what we are trying to do. And um, essentially, the state of relocation currently is not that great. Um, but I think that there's a lot of things that can be can be improved. And this is one of the the follow up documents to some of uh, the research that was there are things that are not necessarily addressed or addressed meaningfully, uh, or areas that the, the practice of picking up a snake and moving it from one place to another could be improved to to um, have uh, better outcomes for the snakes and people. So right now, here's the situation. Somebody has a big rattlesnake in their yard. They don't know anything about snakes. They just moved here from New Jersey. Uh, six months ago, there's a big Western diamondback in their yard. Here are the options that they have. They can ignore it or avoid it. They can move it or disturb it so it goes away. They can responsibly move it uh, or they can kill it. You know, we don't want to kill it. Uh, we also don't want to do uh, a movement of it that's going to uh, do the same and kill it or make it a problem for someone else or, you know, to basically just do this, the same process, but with extra steps. So what things can be improved about this situation? What can that person do other than nothing? Um, this is the, probably my primary interest in this whole thing is how to, how to improve this, how to define um, the, the, the many, many uh, criteria and situations in such a way that it is a repeatable practice that might be rough. Um, and this is one of the things that I am seeing more of. And I'm going to be very critical about uh, to people like me in these, in these cases, the people that are sympathetic to snakes, that want to do the right thing and want to relocate snakes and try to save them. Okay, I'm going to be very critical of this because there are some trends that I'm seeing that I'm not, um, I don't think are, are moving in the right direction. So um, first, putting a snake into a, a bucket is not what relocation is. 
Um, and I, there's a lot of emphasis on this in a lot of uh, training and, and instructions uh, and things that people do where, okay, there's a snake by the front door, put it in a bucket, cool, job's done. No, that's when, that's when things start. Now you have a snake in a bucket. Uh, where are you, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it that meets the right criteria? Uh, one of the things that I think that people like myself can do better is to become consistent with the terminology and try to focus on being able to help those situations, how to take uh, the goodwill, the increase of goodwill that, I, that I'm personally seeing out there towards rattlesnakes and trying to use the information uh, that we have to guide that in the right way. So, um, you know, we, we know that long distance translocation, and again, I would, I would look at the previous um, uh, Snakes are Everything presentation for all the details about this. Long distance translocation is very problematic. Um, there's no situation really where you just take a snake and just drive it up in the mountains and let it go and it's happy. Uh, short distance translocation uh, can also be very problematic and I'll show you um, situations of that too. Um, the, I think that part of the reason that short distance translocation tends to work a lot better is because it makes it easier to be wrong about some of the other uh, assumptions you might make when you're, when you're um, moving that animal. So the consistency of terminology, um, I think it's very important here to, to try to make a difference when talking to individuals, especially other people, when you're talking to them about whether or not relocation is a thing that should be done or not, um, to, to make sure you, you're talking about either translocation or relocation. And relocation is basically just moving it just, just a little bit out of the, the immediate situation. Those are very different things, but they get lumped in uh, together pretty often. Um, these are things that are very important, or at least the snakes think these are important. These are things that are, um, you know, part of the situations of their initial survival in the places where they're, they're found. Uh, species and natural history. These are things that have to be considered if a snake is being moved. Um, I've seen people take a speckled rattlesnake and drive it out into the flats and let it go. I've seen people take a sidewinder and let it go up in the mountains. Those are both dead snakes. Um, so the animals themselves and what they do and when they do it has to be known. It's not just a bunch of rattlesnakes. These are particular specific animals that are doing very particular things and that has to be uh, kept in mind, uh, strongly considered. The line of travel, you know, these animals move around a lot. You don't want to put them in a place where they have to crawl across a freeway to get to the place that they're probably going to spend the spring. Um, the weather and the season, you know, where you put a, a, a speckled rattlesnake in June when it's 114 degrees outside is very different than where you put a speckled rattlesnake in January. Entirely different situations. So you need to know um, all about those things. The condition, is it gravid? Is it a male or a female? Is it juvenile? Um, those can give you information about maybe how much tolerance this animal might have to being moved, uh, how many movements or what kind of movements those animals might be making. Uh, an example, right now, most of the snakes that we're getting, most of the Western diamondbacks, they're all males. Because the males are making these big, arcing uh, movements, looking for females and, and things. It puts them in conflict. Uh, so if you caught a male that was doing that, you can recognize that it's doing that. You might want to relocate that in a slightly different way than a, a you know female. Uh, stress and behavior, being able to recognize if the animal is under stress or if it's injured. Uh, the future development of an area, it's not doing any good if you catch a snake and then release it to some native habitat that has survey markers and is going to you know, be bladed in, in three weeks. So got to know all that stuff, uh, legal and ethical access. And by ethical, uh, that's a big, interesting area. It means that if I catch a really big Western Diamondback rattlesnake and it's right next to a preschool, I might make more considerations about where I'm going to put that snake, uh, things like that. And legal, of course, we're not going to be trespassing and breaking laws. We want everything to be repeatable. We want to process that uh, that in the future, other organizations like ours and other groups can do without becoming necessarily experts on snakes. Uh, human activity in the region, um, is it a hiking area? Don't put a big rattlesnake right on a trail, that kind of thing. And then just the resources. Is there water? Is there places they can eat? Are there places they can hide? Um, the, the problem that ends up happening is that the all of these things end up being boiled down into one criteria, and that is distance. And the idea that uh, an animal um, should be moved to the wrong habitat just because it is native habitat and close is not going to uh, work out well a lot of times. Um, I think I've had 
Uh, I've, I've seen examples where a snake is moved to essentially, you know, a patch of creosote in the medium of, of a busy road because it was the closest, uh, the closest habitat. And it's, it's different than that. So here's what our procedure is. Um, the nearest suitable, meaning a, a, an amalgamate of all those other things, a suitable situation to provide the best chance of survival while minimizing the immediate repeat conflict. Uh, if there's a rattlesnake in someone's driveway, there's going to be another rattlesnake in that person's driveway. You can reduce the amount of rattlesnakes that they might have and the nature of those encounters. Um, but you're not going to say this snake is never going to meet another person, but you don't want it panicking and crawling right back. Uh, so minimize the immediate repeat conflict uh, and then a follow-up action with the homeowners, the property owners, to provide guidance or a direct assistance to reduce the likelihood of future encounters. That's a, that's a lot. It's a mouthful. And if it sounds really complicated, it needs to be. It is a complicated, dynamic situation. There is one slide in particular in Dr. Nowak's uh, presentation where it's, it looks like, you know, there's arrows pointed everywhere and all these things. That's the reality of it, where if you catch a snake, you can't just go move it. It's a lot of stuff. So um, it becomes a challenge because there is an increase in goodwill to do this. But goodwill is not the same thing as, as effective conservation a lot of times. So uh, this is absolutely nothing against our firefighters. Okay, this has nothing to do with that. Uh, but a fact is firefighters probably shouldn't be relocating snakes. And the reason is not because they're not good guys and because they don't wanna um, do right. It's because there's not training for it a lot of times. And even though it's being moved very close nearby, um, a lot of those snakes are gonna suffer injuries. Um, not just being captured themselves, but if you put a snake on the ground and it's 160 degrees on the ground, that snake is going to die. And that happens a lot more than you would know. It happens a, a lot. Um, this is one of the things that we see. We don't have a great way of measuring it, um, but this is a, a um, an event that is notable that happens pretty often. These are adult rattlesnakes and, and a gopher snake um, that on very, very hot days are huddled into the last remaining inch of retreating shade, um, barely surviving, very hot, um, clearly not the situation that they intended to be in. And these are animals that are adults. They've been around a long time. They don't just suddenly make a really bad decision um, like this. And um, this can be caused by development. Um, but I also believe and have seen some evidence for this is also the result of short distance relocations that are not done with the right level of specificity of release criteria. So it's very complicated. Um, but I think as, again, being critical to people like me, um, we gotta be helpful, right? So here's a, here's a, a sentiment that I see pretty often. Um, and by helpful, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is something that I see people say, let's think about it. If a snake is moved, and it's not a quote, but this is a sentiment that I've seen people say, and it could be a quote. If a snake is moved, it may not survive, so you should kill it. Well, you know, uh, being killed is 100% fatal. <laughs> so I think it helps out a lot to not just say, don't do certain things, but, you know, let's let's start to look at our messaging that we're giving to people um, to try and, and be helpful, not be right, but be be helpful. This is a very, very critical part of, of this whole conflict situation. Um, snakes at homes, snakes running into people, people developing, people killing snakes, people relocating snakes, all of that. That is a big section of, of what the challenge is here. But the will to do anything about any of that at all um, starts with the, the culture and the people um, that are encountering these animals. So these are just some examples of, of things that I see from people that mean well. These are people that love snakes. Um, they'll, they'll be overly pedantic. They'll, you know, how many times have you seen someone ask, is this snake poisonous? And they get yelled at because they didn't say it was, you know, it's venomous, not poisonous. And this came to a head for me and became very apparent to me. Uh, in my now hometown of Cave Creek, Arizona. There it is. That's our downtown. Um, it is an interesting area, different than I thought. Um, when I first moved here, I think the the biggest, uh, I told I told Melissa this, that the biggest, uh, the, the big 
news, the big controversy was that Dairy Queen was no longer allowing horses through drive through That was a big problem in this little town. And now we have um, Phoenix just growing right into it and gobbling it up and growing it around it. Uh, the people that are living here and the people that uh, are visiting here are very different than they were 20 years ago. And what ends up happening is that snakes, the idea of them, not just the conflict, but the idea of where they fit in this whole thing, ends up being kind of a, a badge of identity as these two cultures try to kind of figure out um, who's who, right? So my mistake, and this is a mistake I made a long time ago, and I think a lot of people might make this when you're trying to solve this uh, culture, uh, conflict culture thing, is that... Um, Information and education alone is going to save the day. That uh, if you have somebody that is um, you know, terrified of snakes or just says that they hate them, somebody that shoots, you know, they've lived here their whole life, they've shot every snake they've seen for 40 years or, or cut its head off with a shovel. And all you got to do is roll in there with some, you know, here's some interesting snake facts. Uh, that's not going to do anything. It's not going to help them. Um, it's because that's probably not the reason that they're killing them. Uh, so education is an important tool, but you have to have the will. To do it, so here's something that I kind of have have noticed and done, and this is something that has helped me in my own little community and some other ones. Uh, just as kind of an example of the way that this this culture exists and this virtue signaling, good or bad, um, can can cause challenges. And I think sometimes people that like snakes don't realize that when someone says to shoot a snake, it is virtue signaling. Just because you don't see there's virtue in it, they're telling someone else something about themselves. So you know, here's some of those comments. There's the old, you know, kill it before it gets a dog or a kid, just, um, you know, misunderstandings of, of ecology and how the situation works. You know, the old hat band, belt, wallet comments. Um, some good comments too. A lot of people just mentioning various um, uh, statistics about the firearms they own. Um, but there's also ones that are positive that you're going to see here, you know, that there's um, some some people that uh, feel that the snakes in the area are an important part of the area. It's part of what you moved into. And everybody here is commenting things. Basically, you know, once you start seeing it the way that I have recently, of you know, it's not about the snake anymore. Once these conversations get grow, get rolling, once those someone posts a picture of a snake. Um, the information about the animal itself is is almost nowhere in the conversation. It's only individuals chiming in, including myself, um, to kind of state where they stand on it. And you have this culture uh, conflict. And some of these, like these two red ones here, they're saying the same thing, but different outcomes. You not you must be from the city if you're scared of rattlesnakes, or you must be from the city because here we respect rattlesnakes. Those two comments will exist side by side. So here's what I have kind of done as I categorize loosely in, in when I'm responding to these or reading them or if I'm trying to affect this uh, in a number of different ways, understanding that all these are, are virtue signals in some way uh, to achieve some sort of, um, you know, a social benefit of, of saying, here's who I am, this is my identity here. Um, there's these ones that are just the register, you know, I call it the, the registering your presence, where you just go in there. It's, a, it's one step above trolling, but it's also kind of a vote. Someone just says that they shoot the snakes in some way, you know, they're just saying, here I am, uh, don't like them. Um, they're also saying, I'm from here. I've lived here longer than you. This is how we've always done things. We maybe don't feel great about you coming in here, changing that. And then there's honest negative. I call it that because these are people that are probably actually really trying, they're not trolling in any way. They're not just trying to be jerks. Um, they just don't necessarily understand um, the reality of it, that, that, you know, if there's a snake that is allowed to live, that it is a definite thing that is going to kill a dog or a kid. That's obviously not the case, but a lot of people actually think that. So um, that's, a, that's a very different thing than somebody that's just kind of sh shooting snakes. Um, there's people that kill every snake they see. They've always done that. And the reason they do that is they've never thought of, thought of it differently. That's what their parents did. That's what their parents did. That's just, it's so baked in. It's not a thing that's ever been discussed. And then there's also on this positive where um, there's people that um, are trying to do things that I would agree with uh, to advocate for the snakes, the preservation or the, the coexistence of the snakes. But it's also part of the same thing. You know, when I'm doing that, I recognize that I'm, I'm registering that. I'm also kind of trying, I'm saying here I am. Right. So once I see it this way, it becomes a little easier to kind of sort these out and figure out what to do with it, because what you're really trying to do is not to get um, not to change 
um, you know, to get rid of all the negative comments or get rid of all the register presence comments. You're not going to do that. Um, what you want to be able to do is try to convert some of those individuals that find that snakes are an important aspect of their individuality of being from here to being able to achieve the same results, but through a more positive outcome. Uh, it's a really interesting thing to me uh, because my background before I did all this was uh, marketing. I did marketing more. And once I started looking at it that way, oh, it's just a marketing problem. This is, it's a marketing problem. There's a bunch of people that think a certain way and you're trying to provide information in a way that changes how people think about something. And so that's how I'm approaching it now. And I think it's very important for us to be helpful. Um, it's not saying that you have to be super friendly to everybody that, you know, texts you a picture of a snake's head being sawed off just to uh, be a troll. But if somebody you think is actually just, you know, they're a good person, they're a good person. That's how it is. This is a thing that we disagree in. And I think that we can um, figure out some ways to, uh, to get around it. I already did that one. Uh, so what do we go from here? You know, this is, it's a lot. It's a huge, huge topic. This could easily be, you know, any of these could be a larger presentation, but, you know, we all have, we got to eat dinner at some point. So uh, what are things that we can do? This is what I think that uh, sustainable coexistence to rattlesnakes in, in Phoenix could look like and how, and how we get there. It's a long road, but I know that it is possible because I've seen it happen with Gila monsters. Um, 10 years ago, when this, when rattlesnake solutions was, was pretty new, uh, we had a lot of people that would kill Gila monsters. We would be called to go get relocations of Gila monsters because they would be killed. Otherwise, uh, we'd be, we'd get to a call to get there. And by the time we're there, the guy has already cut the Gila monster's head off. You know, someone posts a Gila monster photograph on Facebook and or I guess MySpace. <laughs> um, and half the comments were about how dangerous it is and how it needs to be killed. That is not how it is now. If, if you want to get roasted, post anything negative about someone seeing these treasured jewels of the desert, the Gila monsters. This has happened. This is a transformation in that. Uh, Rattlesnakes are a little bit different, but I, I think it's possible. So the biggest thing is just to try to, uh, through physical and, and information means, try to reduce the conflict as much as we can. A lot of those is trying to provide guidance to developers, uh, communities, homeowners associations, uh, homeowners themselves, other businesses, landscapers, uh, people that do wall construction, all of that, just things that can be changed in minor ways a lot of times that can really cut down conflict. Uh, a, a favorite that I see every day is landscaping that's all lantana. Every house has low cover, um, well watered habitat that's perfect for snakes. And then next to it is a big pile of rocks for erosion control that becomes a rattlesnake den. Absolutely. You know, you could probably change those things a little bit. Uh, the other thing is just to try to get across this, this idea that is accurate, is that most of the time doing nothing is the right action. There's a rattlesnake in my backyard. So what? It's in the back corner. Are you going back there? Do you have control over your kids and your dog? Can you leave it there and check on it in a couple of days and see if it left? That's the that's the desired action. That's what I do at my house. Uh, we don't relocate rattlesnakes in my house. I to go tell my wife and kid where they are and we talk about it. hey don't go over here there's a snake there or be careful you know this this is the desired outlook as far as, far as i'm concerned it recognizes that these are animals can pose a danger um but changes the way that um that this uh it's it's, it's done uh if action is required that it's done responsibly it's kind of a joke uh, that i tell people but it's also a very good moral guideline for us as a private business is that the goal here is to put ourselves out of business if someday you know the fantasy is that everybody just you know it's all worked itself out and we're not needed anymore uh, obviously it's not going to happen um, but it's a good direction to point and that's one of the things is if everybody doesn't need relocations anymore awesome uh, short distance mitigation is a point of entry to long-term sustainable methods. So every time we go to somebody's house and catch a snake for them, we have an opportunity to tell them what they can do differently to see fewer rattlesnakes, how they could feel differently about it, try to provide as much information as we can for people that would otherwise not be seeking it. Most of the people that we come in contact with would not end up sitting through a presentation like this or spending a Saturday learning about snakes or even Googling it. It's just the thing that they'd not interested in until there's suddenly a snake there and it just bit their dog. And now they're very interested in it. So this is our point of entry into that, uh, the rest of the iceberg, basically. Um, to foster a knowledgeable public with socially benefit 
beneficial positive culture. That's what I was just talking about. I'm trying to do here in Cave Creek, but basically just try to change the outlook so that people can be proud of the native wildlife that they have rather than to be uh, proud of their, their um, adversarial history with it and to be a useful guide for those with good intentions. That is a tricky thing. It's very good. I'm, I'm super happy that all, all that there just seem to be all these great, you know, snake identification groups and people that are going out and buying buckets and trying to do this thing. Um, it needs to be done responsibly. And I think that's something that all of us can, you know, people that love snakes can, can probably agree on is that the best way to do this is to try to be as helpful as we can. Anybody that says, you know what, I used to not like snakes, but now I like them. You know, how can we help you? That kind of situation. So I think if all these things come together, it's going to be a much better situation. That's kind of what we're shooting for. Here's a situation like that, whereas King Snake at somebody's house and by the end everyone you know these kids are going to have experiences with these snakes so instead of you know the opening slide where i said that you can do certain things with that snake and at the end is kill it um, what we want is just informed people that only move a snake if it's absolutely necessary and um, try to prevent those unwanted, unwanted encounters entirely when i was a kid i went to a presentation about snakes and i i liked snakes already but I held a, a scarlet king snake and it changed my life. I'm still doing this. Those are huge things. So kids like this that are touching this king, king snake, you know, these go at such a huge way uh, to do it. And we wouldn't be at this house if they didn't call us to come and remove that snake. And then sustainability. This is that snake fencing that uh, Melissa had talked about. Uh, I don't like to talk about a whole lot. I have to get over that because I don't, I, I feel, I always feel, um, slimy in some way, like I'm hawking a product if I talk about it, but that's that's not it. I believe in it. I think uh, what we got to do is change these situations to where if we go and catch a snake in someone's yard and move it, that the snake is moved, but also the homeowner has everything they need to know to prevent that one unwanted encounter. And this is what I refer to it as. Uh, it's the battle of 40 feet. And that means that um, coexisting with rattlesnakes in an area as big as Phoenix doesn't look like having areas where snakes are and areas where people are, or having everybody being fine with a rattlesnake being right next to their front door versus not being okay with that. Um, it might be this. This is a Western Diamondback that's right by the front door. If that snake were 40 feet out into that wash under a bush, it's not a problem. So we're not dealing with, you know, it looks very different when you take it in bites like that. We're not trying to solve a huge, huge, huge problem. We're trying to solve a lot of these little individual ones where the snake can exist there. We're just trying to get it to do slightly different things. And the people have slightly different expectations. And that is very doable. Um, so to close it up, I'm just going to show you some of the fun situations that we get into. A lot of stories. Won't get into all of them, but these Halloween ones always kind of crack me up. Uh, we we provide services for free across the the state on Halloween because this happens. People think they're decorations. <laughs> There's decorations put out. Obviously, it becomes a place that snakes can hide. Right when all these snakes are moving around, uh, an ingress to dens, and all these kids running around with poor visibility at night with no flashlights. So problems, right? But these Halloween ones are kind of. Uh, interesting you know it looks like a decoration there's a speckled rattlesnake sitting there with some decorations this happens a lot western diamondback trying to get a drink falls into the pool the person's going out there to jump in the pool gets a little surprise um this is a rattlesnake in a garage so garages are often places where rattlesnakes will spend in the winter here they'll, they'll den here in small numbers and they always do this thing that very much is like what they do in the wild with dens to where once they're about to start staging outwards from the den, they come and kind of congregate near the entrance. They do this in garages too. So you can get a garage that's just completely full of stuff. And most of us can tell you in two seconds if there's a rattlesnake that's in there in the spring because they leave tracks in those corners. It's a really interesting, consistent thing. And then we have situations like this. This is a pair of Western Diamondbacks courting and eventually mating. Um, and I think these are... These ones are great for me because um, in the middle of all this conflict, in the middle of all this stuff, it's not just a bunch of rattlesnakes striking at people and rattling at people and, and screaming people with shovels. It's not, it's not always that way. Uh, in the middle of all that, there are these animals living in these social dynamic populations that are doing what snakes do. It just looks weird when it's in the garage. <laughs> so we get to see a lot of cool things like this and you know, we get all excited when we show up to deal with these situations. But I always just think it's it's amazing seeing this, that, that these animals, um, you know, they figured it out. They're, they're doing what they're going to do. Uh, and it might be scaring some people, but that's something we can work on. 
I think is the last one of these weird situations. This is, as far as I know, the only timber rattlesnake that's actually been found in Arizona. Um, I have it, it's right over there, uh, because it can't be released. It's timber rattlesnake. We don't even know where it came from. Uh, it showed up in a warehouse, a natural gas warehouse in downtown Phoenix. And uh, Marissa, who went out there to go catch it, got the call, hey, there's a rattlesnake here. And I'm like, okay, well, come get your night snake, you know, in internally. Go down there, it's a timber rattlesnake. So it hitched a ride from somewhere in the east as a neonate. No idea where it comes from. Anyway, it's a couple of years old now. It's doing okay. But that was just kind of an interesting little side night. So um, and this is the last slide, and then uh, I'll turn back over to you. Um, but uh, this is a fun one for me because this is an unposed photograph of uh, the answer to the snake repellent work. Uh, this is a Western diamondback that is living amongst the bags of it. And this is not an uncommon situation. I wish it worked. I just didn't. So um, that is my presentation. And Melissa, if you want to, do I kick myself off here? Let's see. Thank you. Or we can keep that slide up if you want. Okay, um, cool. But yeah, thanks. That was awesome. Um, I have questions and comments, but I feel like because I know we got some ahead of time and and I imagine people who are attending live have them as well. So if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or you can like do the raise the hand thing. And um, if you want, if you want to like turn on your camera and microphone, that's there. So we can do that first before getting to the questions that were submitted ahead of time, just because it's already after six and I don't want to keep everybody too long. Um, so a question about responsible rodent control and could you expand on what this means? Um, don't use poisons. Don't use things that could um, hurt other animals and predators. I mean, that's all, it's all part of it, right? So if you don't want rattlesnakes around, you also don't want to be killing bobcats and road runners and uh, king snakes and, and other things that might actually even eat rattlesnakes. So um, there's a lot of uh, varying information about the effects of poison on, on predators, um, but you know, it's something that can have an effect. Uh, responsible rodent control basically means to to do what you can to ex exclude them without um, uh, or kill them. You know, let's say use snap traps if if you need to, but don't do so in a way that is going to hurt the 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 ecology of the area. Something that's going to be a widespread effect, and because you might have an opposite effect than you imagined. Yeah, and no glue traps. I don't think you no specifically mentioned yeah. that. No glue traps. That's a horrible way to die and catches. Horrible. Everything I, yeah, with kind of like our problem with, with poisons, they're, they're both non-target. Anybody who comes across it or comes across the first one who ate the poison is then, you know, potentially stuck. And I guess that happens with glue traps sometimes too, is like traps the scorpion, which then traps the lizard, which then traps the snake or, and so on. Um, I think that's something I would really like to, you know, there's a project there somewhere of to see, you know, here's how many uh, scorpions, a banded gecko eats in a month. Here's how many scorpions a glue trap kills in a month. There could be a, yeah. a net negative. You could be having more by just killing off the predators. So I think that'd be an interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, um, I hadn't thought of it. I like, I have a picture of that series, but, um, but yeah, I hadn't thought about how much more effective promote geckos as scorpion killers. I would mm. like some more in my house. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> geckos. All right, let's see. Um, do the snake? I assume they uh, do the snakes travel through rodent tunnels. I think that may be how they get into my walled yard. Uh, they can. It depends on the the uh, the wall. I think a lot of people are surprised. They can also go around the front. So sometimes you have the back, and it's really good. They can get under gates. Uh, in some situations, they can climb. They can climb bushes. So. Um, yeah, it's possible. Any anything that they can fit into there, there there is a way in. So if you have rodent holes that go underneath the wall, absolutely. Yep. Other than the timber rattlesnake you mentioned and ball pythons, have you ever found any other exotic? Well, they, any exotic venomous snakes on your calls? <laughs> no, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> um, I've had I've had a few or somebody calls and it's in Tempe and it's like we have a we have a cobra in the bathtub. I'm like, oh, just send me a picture. And they sent me a, a black three foot long snake. And I'm like, that's a cobra. I'm going, I'm coming, I'm coming. It was a king snake. I wasn't thinking critically because I wasn't expecting a pet king snake. Thankfully, no. 
thankfully yeah. no, but it'll probably happen at some point. And we do have some other stories that I uh, I can't speak about publicly to where there have been in incidences, but it's not something that would be a problem for the public. Ay, ay, ay. Um, your take on the rattlesnake vaccine, I assume this is the rattlesnake vaccine from do for dogs, if you have one. I'm sure you get lots of questions about that because a lot, I know for us, a lot of the people who are concerned about snakes in their yards because of their dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what I will do, because I'm not a vet, is I'll tell you what I would do for my dog. For my dog, I would not give them the vaccine because the it's the recommendation of uh, some great doctors at the uh, National Snake Bite Support Group. Um, and some studies that have shown that it is not proven to be effective. And there can be some problems like uh, uh, anaphylaxis with, with dogs that have never had a rattlesnake beef bite before. So it's summer according to those studies, somewhere between ineffective and uh, potentially dangerous. So I wouldn't give it to my dog, but I would talk with your vet. Yeah, totally. Um, oh my gosh, they're coming in too fast for me to keep up with. Okay, <laughs> there was a question about um, homeowners and businesses. I mean, I think you already kind of covered, like should focus on rodent control first if they're having repeated snake problems, that that's probably the best place to start. Yeah. Road control and make some hard decisions about the landscaping. I uh, you know, went to a house yesterday. They had just, they moved there. They installed tons of rosemary all over the property and had, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of rattlesnakes there. So you have to start making decisions like that. Of Look at the yard as habitat, worse habitat, fewer snakes. <laughs> um, let's see. On... A presentation of yours, I assume this is yours, Brian, that they um, someone watched earlier today, you mentioned wanting to study pack rat mounds. Um, and I guess that's, oh. that presentation was old. Has someone done that already? Um, I was, I was, somebody asked me about pack rat. So I was releasing a snake into a pack rat nest. So I did a live video and I was talking about it. Uh, and what I was referring to is that there's a, um, you know, I think if you, you probably know as well, I'm sure that uh, pack rats, wood rats and rattlesnakes in different areas have a pretty interesting uh, coexistence. Um, I have a lot of situations where we're at a house and we pull the top off of a pack rat nest and there's a big western diamondback coiled up right next to a, a nest of, of baby mice and they're all fine. So I think there's there's probably something interesting happening there to where, you know, uh, I don't want to say symbiosis too early, but I think that there's definitely a lot of interesting things happening, maybe potential benefit to both animals. So I would like to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. We've been kind of surprised at the times we've seen pack rats approaching snake, like not just in the denning season, but like during the active season, approaching rattlesnakes that are large enough to eat them and just don't seem scared at all. So it's like, yeah. what do you know that we're missing <laughs> out on? <laughs> yeah, it's something. I mean, I have yeah. uh, I have uh, some some time lapse video of a, a place where it's a it's a pack rat midden and there's tons of them crawling around it, like going in and out every day. Um, a tiger rattlesnake and two speckled rattlesnakes gave birth around the same time in the same area. So there's a pack rat just sitting there and there's rattlesnakes everywhere crawling around. And like, this is, it's interesting. At yeah. least it's interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. Um, okay. Someone is asking, in your opinion, do you think it's okay to try to move a basking snake off the road so that they won't get run over? Sure. Yeah. If you feel like you can safely do so, if you can save it from being, you know, I would say the one thing is if possible to move it in the direction of travel, because otherwise it's going to try again in 20 minutes and might get hit. Um, but don't do anything you're not, um, you know, comfortable doing, obviously, but yeah, I do all the time. Yeah. And I, I would add to that um, a tip that um, I, I was given at a presentation a long time ago. Someone said that, um, they, and this was in Arizona too, someone, they carry like a bag of sand around with them. So when they see a snake on the road that they sort of like throw that towards the snake's tail. So hopefully it, it scares them into like continuing in that direction. And that way, because they weren't a, a snake handler, or like a, that mm -hmm. much of a snake enthusiast, they just didn't want them to get run over. Um, so they didn't have to approach the snake and elicit, like sometimes as you're approaching rattlesnakes, especially ones that are out moving like that, they want to coil up into that defensive thing. And so sometimes that helps and is a really safe way if you have something kind of, you know, lightweight enough where you're not going to hurt the snake, um, but to kind of just scare them away. If it, you know, if it's a non-venomous one, not a big deal, but if it's a venomous yeah. snake. That's a really good idea, actually. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> I've recommended it now a lot. 
Um, let's see. <laughs> was it, is there something particular about rosemary attracting rattlesnakes or just because it was nice little shrubby habitat? It's the, it's the habitat type. I think um, um, I just watched, a, I wish I had the, the name of the, the paper that uh, I would just had read about this, but I was using our data and was looking at land cover and plant types, and it's this low cover. Uh, so rosemary and lantana uh, and natal plum in particular uh, tend to be overwatered and under-maintained. They tend to have a big, dense, wet pile of leaf litter underneath all of them and rodents like it. So it's not the plant itself that's attracting to it. It's, it's It rots and it's warm in the winter. It's cold and wet in the summer and there's always food there and places to hide so it's just this kind of you know it's like the 7-eleven for for a venomous snake and uh it's just the default plant that people put here so you know get rid of it <laughs> well um there are some nice like thank yous and great presentation and they really enjoy it um thank you very much. there's also still a lot more questions <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I, I got all night. So as long, okay. as, or as long as you do, I'm okay. If we got to end it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'm going to shoot for 630 okay. and for any questions that we don't get to that have been submitted by then. And as well, ones that came back earlier, like I have everyone's contact information so I can, I can get the, get that to you. Um, get it to Brian. If it's something that, um, that he needs to answer or get it back to people, but let's see how many we can get through. Um, are the Mojave are there Mojave rattlesnakes in Arizona? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> Easy. They're not everywhere, um, but they are found. Are, is that one of the species that's in the Phoenix area? Yes, but not not species? that many. So um, they're they're kind of specialists, and I think a lot of times they're not seen that way. But they they live in that you know Colorado River desert scrub type flat habitat, and are apparently pretty sensitive. Basically, as soon as a road gets put around an area, they they blink out pretty quickly um so yes but small pockets and um you know far east apache junction and parts of peoria vistancia still have a good number of them but yeah i have um i've heard that from others as well that they they seem like one of those species that doesn't do well around people um yeah. Not helpful that everyone is out to get them, but um, there's <laughs> yeah. probably just as many other species of rattlesnakes that are killed because people think they are green Mojaves, which is mm -hmm. like whole another green. whole another talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, thoughts on whether people who are working outside a lot should wear like snake chaps. Sure. If, if you feel like it, I mean, it, it can be hot. It can also protect you from cactus and cat claw. That's why I wear them half the time. Um, you know, if you have high boots, I wear my usual work boots I wear to work with snakes. I have uh, 10 inch high leather boots. I have insulation in them, uh, even though it's hot, but it gets a little extra padding there and then loose fitting pants. Uh, because a lot of times that venom is going to end up on the first surface that it comes in contact with, and you'd rather be on your pant leg instead of in your leg. Um, but if you want some extra protection, yeah, I, I wear uh, turtle skins uh, uh, regularly, depending on what I'm doing. So it'd be a good idea if you see a lot of snakes. Is turtle skins like a, a brand name? I assume yeah. not actually. It's a brand name of, of, of snake leggings, basically. And they're not Velcro. They're 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 lightweight. They're easy to put on, and they're they're durable. It they okay. doesn't look cool. like you're like going into, you know, uh, a suit of armor or something like that. It just looks like weird pants. Yeah, this is um this is the first year we have discussed wearing snake chaps out in the field because just the Southwest has had two awesome monsoon seasons, which is great, and then also a wet winter. So there's just like grass, mm -hmm. and I mean, you just. It feels unsafe for the first time in the 20 something years I've been here. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not, I, well, I'll just ask. So someone has a question about um, allergies, like um, humans developing allergies to rattlesnakes and rattlesnake venom. Um, so, you know, those of us who handle them a lot, and I don't know if that's something that you have knowledge to share? I mean, they asked if you touched yeah. on that during the talk, which is the answer to that part is no. Um, yeah, it's a big concern. Um, so I've, I've known people that have had problems with that. I've known people that have uh, died um, or come very close to death and not from like it, from the allergic reaction to the venom. Um, so I wear gloves, not when I'm just dealing with venom, but the snakes at all. If I'm cleaning poop out or anything, I never touch 
as much as I can, I don't touch any protein that that animal makes. Um, if I'm doing something like cleaning out a cage, if there's any kind of dust, I wear a face mask, which are now, you know, very abundant and easy to, to get. Um, yeah, it's, it's a concern. I also have an EpiPen. Um, so it's a thing that can happen. You don't even know when that's gonna when that's gonna happen, but I'm I'm more worried about them than that than the actual effects of the venom. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, let's see. So I, in his other, he asked if there was like documentation, websites, study research. I have heard lots of anecdotes as well, just echoing what Brian said about knowing people who have who have died and um, who've had very bad, scary reactions, but. I am not aware of any studies on that. Uh, um, I don't, I'm not either, but I want to find out. So that National Snake, Snake Bite Support Group on Facebook, uh, I think I'll go ask them. Yeah. They might have it in their documents too. It's a thing that I think, yeah, we all talk about it. So maybe good to know mm -hmm. um, that's been measured. Let's see. Thanks for all your great info. They've used it to help um, with their own personal encounters with snakes. And I guess they are a docent at the Desert Museum in Tucson. And so they pass awesome. that along and their work there. Cause yeah, I'm sure there's lots of questions about snakes at the Desert yeah, Museum. Great. Oh man, eight more questions. Okay. okay. Um, wow, any thoughts on possible habitat corridors for a big area like Phoenix for snakes? I I feel like, and I assume this is kind of related to that, there's all this talk in the past few years about like wildlife crossings. And most mm -hmm. of those are designed in such a way that like snakes and other small animals aren't going to use them. So I don't know if that's specifically what they're talking about, but I, it, yeah. It, it may not be useful here. I mean, so that for the snakes in particular, I think that the big change that could be kind of an approximation of, of the, the spirit of that would be to design regional parks a little bit differently. So in the um, Phoenix Mountain Preserve, there's, you know, the mountain itself, and there's a lower Bajada and the flats that surround it and all that kind of the dynamic transition there. In the areas that have that full transition, you see full diversity and stable populations. In areas where it's just the mountain and the, the flat and the Bajadas have had homes there. That's where I was mentioning the, the Diamondbacks are still living in the area. So I think that's one of the hopeful outputs that we're going to have here is if you're going to preserve an area, you need to preserve the entirety of the dynamic habitat. And I think that would kind of do the same, like a similar thing to uh, as a, as a, a corridor because they're not going to be traveling through there, but it would allow for the entirety of those populations to exist. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. So someone is asking for precautions they can take as a photographer so that they they don't disturb snakes to the point of changing their behavior and making them leave. And I think they're talking about more sort of the, the bigger picture of that that you mentioned in your presentation, not like, oh, mm -hmm. now they're just rattling at me and I wanted to take a nice yeah. in-situ photo. Um, just try, try to be quick. You know, that's the thing is that a lot of times you, you don't even know if you're disturbing a snake. And we will look at this. If you go there and there's a snake and it doesn't flick a tongue, it's just sitting there. You get all your photos of it and your friend busts out his tripod and you're there for 45 minutes and the snake hasn't moved. If you leave and then come back two minutes later, that snake is gone. Yep. So just because you, you weren't aware and it wasn't rattling it, it doesn't mean that snake is not going, oh, don't eat me. Don't see me. So the things we've had the best success with just leaving them alone is just get to know your gear. Get good at rolling up there. If you're going to take a photograph of it, get a couple of shots and move on. And you're going to have a better chance of getting a shot. You know, let's say you don't get the shot you want. Well, you'll see the snake again because you're not disturbing it. And that's it's going to not have to go in. You know, keep in mind they're ambush predators. If every single day there's somebody that loves snakes and goes in there and scares them another hole, they can no longer do what they're going to do. They're going to move. Uh, so just keep it as minimal as you can. Get a good zoom lens and be okay with having photos that have some sticks in the way. <laughs> yes be okay with that um yeah all that that's pretty much how we try to to do it too um let's see another thanks for the presentation thank you for the presentation oh um so someone is, is saying that they've they watch some show or something that talks about relocating snakes in australia and that there are permits required and so they are wondering in Arizona, is it illegal to relocate snakes without a license? Um, and yeah, I'm actually kind of curious about that too. What is the like licensing training, et cetera, requirements to do the kind of stuff that you do sort of working towards like what you talked mm -hmm. about and we've talked about before about, you know, 
best practices for this kind of work? Yeah, so there's a wildlife services permit, it's called, and that is the permit to be able to offer this to the public. So if you have, um, you know, you, I, there's nobody, you know, it kind of falls outside of the, the realm here. I think you can, if you want to really save, have a, a hunting license, if you have a rattlesnake on your property and want to move it somewhere, um, that's that's fine. Um, but if you want to offer it to the public in any capacity, then it is a license thing and it would be illegal to do it without. Um, there's other considerations there too. There's also insurance. So this is a thing that, you know, I would not, it is a potentially dangerous job. And if you don't know the person that's coming there, you don't want anyone that's on your property that can sue you if the snake that they're catching bites you. And that, that can happen. Um, so yeah, there's a lot. So wildlife services license, the type of insurance that you would want is a, a general liability and professional liability uh, and workers comp if you have other types of people are doing it. The stipulations in the wildlife services permit um, state the distance and then also um, the, the key area thing for us is it's it's one quarter mile preferred within one quarter mile unless that's not possible. So that's where you know we'll we'll make a note if we if we, if we can't do that. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's there's no two that are the same. There's never like designated drop-off points or anything like that. So that's that's what I would say the bar is. And that's what I'm trying to work with uh, Game and Fish on as an output to uh, to a lot of the work we're doing is I think those stipulations need to be more, more exact, but also done in a way that somebody can perform those actions without, um, you know, deep knowledge of the snakes. You know, I think outlining some things, you know, so complicated. Yeah, totally complicated. I believe all, uh, Erica Novak said that in her presentation a million times too. <laughs> complicated. It is. It's not. It to, not yeah, it totally good. is. Yeah. Um. All right. Everything else in the chat is just a lot of thank yous and compliments, and this information has been very helpful. Um. And I think we've gotten to at least the gist of most of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. I'm just kind of scanning them to Great. see if there were. Any, anything else that we didn't cover at all? Um, I mean, this is something you said you were kind of work on working on, but I don't know if you're ready to, to answer this question yet. Um, so someone asked about like when houses are built and new neighborhoods put in place, are there things that they can do to protect the snakes? So I assume this would be again to like avoid those conflict situations. I mean, mm -hmm. not so much like, you know, make sure you're not bulldozing during the winter like a den or whatever but <clears throat> um so when there is let's say yes, there's a couple of different parties that would be involved there but i think that uh, let's say you're a developer and this is the hardest one because a lot of these decisions are made elsewhere and by the time that someone buys that home the the person that's building the home is out of the picture so it's kind of a hard thing to to get some some traction here but it would be just to to take a hard look at some of those habitat types that are known to cause conflict and not just with rattlesnakes, but also uh, coyotes, uh, things mm -hmm. that cause problems for, for people that are not suspecting that those are the case. So just looking at the way that walls are built, looking at the ways that erosion control is done, looking at the vegetation, that kind of stuff. So if you're a homeowner in that situation and you're moving into one of those areas, um, I would think probably the best thing that you could do, aside from just, you know, moving snakes out of the road, if you see them, but the best long-term thing would be to try to advocate on their behalf in the community. If, if it's a new development and you're all moving in there, you're all in the same boat. All your neighbors and you have that in common. None of you have lived there before. So you get kind of an opportunity to establish what the what's the local culture going to be like. Is this a place where we kill all the snakes or is this a place where we you know, hey, hey, HOA, this place is causing a problem. Can we get rid of this lantana over here? You want to be that kind of community. So that's probably the best thing. Just be be vocal uh, and be influential in the new community. That, um, yeah, that is a great idea. I think a lot of times people come to when they have a family member or a neighbor or a friend, or maybe it's just one of their Facebook connections, they come to somebody like you, Brian, or us saying like, Hey, you know, can you tell them like, blah, blah, blah. But people are much more likely to listen to someone in their network of people. Um, it, it's, it seems like this is maybe especially more true now than it might've been 20 years ago or whatever, but the Probably. opinions of experts means much less than like, you know, 
like you said, you can help establish the culture of that neighborhood because you're all in this together. This is where you live too. And that's going to be taken very differently than somebody from somewhere else who's like, oh, well, yeah, that snake freak, of course, they're going to say to whatever, leave them alone. Yeah. They live a million miles away. They don't get them in their yard. And, mm-hmm. and all of, of course that. we don't No. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the goal on, on anything like that is just to just imagine a person that is knowingly or otherwise seeking social validation. Can they achieve that best by something negative or something positive towards snakes? It's the yep. same mechanism, but you can influence the way that they, um, that they get that. Yeah. All right. I think that's an excellent, eh, excellent place to wrap it up. Um, if you are watching this recording later, feel free to stick any questions that came up for you that we didn't answer um, in the comments, and I will I will answer them or we'll get them to Brian, um, and I'm sure he's happy to answer them later. But um, but yeah, we've already this has been a long one because it was a great presentation. There were a lot of awesome questions, and yeah, thank you um, so much. Thank you, Brian, for coming tonight. To everyone who tuned in our supporters who make snakes or everything and everything else possible. And yeah, snakes still have a lot of uh, snakes still have a lot to teach us. So I hope you'll join us on the next episode of snakes or everything and take care. And thank you for everything you do for snakes every day. Thanks. See you. Yeah. Good night, everybody.